for this session, we will talk about your presentation of financial statements, including your uh, first time adoption of your PFRS. So we will talk about PAS1 and PFRS1. We start first with PAS1. So what is the scope of your PAS1? PAS1 is entitled as your presentation of financial statements. So it provides you guidelines on your proper presentation of financial statements. So under PAS1, if you look into your provisions, we have here guidelines that is applicable to all your FS. And then we have your guidelines only for a specific FS, okay? So it provides guidelines for your uh, all financial statements. Normally, uh, you know this one as your overall considerations. Well, for your specific FS, only those uh, guidelines applicable to your financial statements, it's specifically to a particular financial statement, okay? So let's discuss your first scope, okay? So scope of your past one. What is the scope of your past one? So when we talk about your scope, we talk about the applicability of your past one. So where does your, plus, your past one applies? Past one applies only to general purpose financial statements. So when we talk about your general purpose financial statements, these are your financial statements applied or prepared for all users, okay? So it is tailored to all users. Normally, it only applies to your general purpose financial statements. This is to ensure the compatibility of your financial statements from period to period. That is your intra-comparability and also to compare your financial statements to other entities. So this is to ensure your comparability either inside the entity from period to period or outside the entity. Now, when we talk about your financial statements, your financial statements can either be general purpose or special purpose. So when we talk about your general purpose, this is again for all users and normally tailor made to meet the common needs of the users. While for a specific purpose financial statement, this is only for a specific users. This is to meet the specific needs of users. When we talk about your general purpose financial statements, these are your financial statements provided under your PAS1. So what are the complete set again of financial statements as we have discussed before in your conceptual framework? First, we have your statement of financial position. Next, we have your statement of comprehensive income. Next, we have your statement of cash flows. And then we have your notes to financial statements. Further, we also have your statement of changes in equity. And then lastly, we have your comparative financial statements for any re-statement as provided for by your standard. Again, what are the relationships of these different financial statements? First, we need to prepare your statement of comprehensive income. So what are the items again on your statement of comprehensive income? We have your profit or loss for the period. And then we have your other comprehensive income items. So again, we have under your SCI two types of financial statement. We have your statement of comprehensive income or other comprehensive income and your statement of financial performance or your income statement. What again is the difference between the two financial statements? Under your statement of financial performance, we only have your profit or loss. In your other comprehensive income or statement of other comprehensive income, we have your profit or loss together with the items of OCI. So if we still remember what are the items of OCI again, we have your mnemonics, we have your mnemonic, write or 
cited. So we have your evaluation surplus, investments carried under fair value through other comprehensive income, we have your translations, gains, or losses of foreign financial statement. We have your employee benefits as to your uh, actuarial gains or losses. And then we have your derivatives that is designated as a cash flow hedge. Okay? So after preparation of SEI, the items on your SEI is presented in your changes in equity. So when we talk about your changes in equity, we look into your contributed capital and your earned capital. Contributed capital pertains to any investment or withdrawals or any changes in your equity participation of the owners. And then we have your earned capital. This talks about your retained earnings wherein we place here the items of your SI. Now, after we prepare a statement of changes in equity, we use the data in your statement of changes in equity in your statement of financial position. What is again presented in your statement of financial position? We have your assets, liabilities, and equity. Particularly, equity portion comes from your statement of changes in equity. Further, you can also prepare your statement of cash flows. This pertain to your changes in cash. So we try to look as to your beginning and your ending cash. And we look as to what made the change on your beginning and ending cash. And this beginning and ending cash is uh, look into depending on the type of activity which relates to your change. So what are those different changes? So these changes can either be an increase or a decrease. So what brought this increase or decrease? So we classify them according to your activity. So we have your operating activity, operating activity, financing activity, and then we have your investing activity. So we look over the differences of your beginning and ending cash, and that difference is either an increase or decrease depending on the activity. What is the activity that can either be operating, financing, or investing? So this change in your cash, whatever is your ending cash, is presented in your asset. Further, for you to properly understand these different standards, your statement of comprehensive income, a statement of changes in equity, statement of cash flows, and statement of financial position, we have your notes to financial statement. Normally, these are different disclosure notes to aid in the understanding of your uh, items of financial statements. So whatever is presented in your SCI, SCE, SCF, or SFP, these items, if ever we have a corresponding note, it will be presented in your notes to FS. So how does your notes to FS look like? So let's say we have here your SFP. Okay, we list on your SFP the different assets. So we have here your cash, we have your receivables. And then beside that, we have your amounts, right? So let's say your cash is 1 million and your receivables is 500,000. So cash and then we have your amount. So beside or in between your cash and the amount are different notes. So if ever, guys, we have here a note and then nakalagay one, it means that the uh, different disclosures pertaining to cash is presented under your note one. So in short, all notes, guys, are pre-numbered. And this particular note, as, a, as has been presented in your SFP, can be seen in your notes to FS. So if it's cash one, it is in note one. You look on your notes to financial statement and under note one, it is there. It is presented the different disclosures pertaining to cash. How about if receivables is placed as 10? It means that the notes pertaining to receivables, any disclosure pertaining to receivables is presented in note 10. Okay? So that's the relationship, again, of the different financial statements as we have discussed before in your conceptual framework. So again, when we talk of your general purpose financial statements, this talks about your common needs. And this common needs is met under your 
past one complete set of financial statements. So what are those again? Statement of financial position, statement of comprehensive income, statement of cash flows, notes to financial statement, statement of changes in equity, and your comparative financial statement. Okay? But if we talk about your specific purpose financial statement, we are only talking about your specific needs of users. So what are these types of financial statements? So the following are uh, examples of your statement of uh, special purpose financial statement. First, we have your budgets, your different budgets. So let's say cash budget, operation budget, receivable budget, your income budget. So those are examples of your specific purpose financial statement. Normally, a specific purpose financial statement is only used by your management. Okay, So normally, it is only tailored or used for your management use. Okay, So again, what is the scope of your past one? It applies to general purpose financial statement. But it does not apply to special purpose financial statement. And what are your general purpose financial statement? It is provided under PASS 1. It is known as your complete set of financial statements. So we have here 1 to 6. And then when we go to your special purpose financial statements, we said PASS 1 does not apply to it. And it is only for the specific needs of users. These users are your management. Examples are your different kinds of budgets or reports so only the user can make use of it okay what is the purpose of financial statement again we already learned this one under your conceptual framework we said that the purpose is to provide information useful for decision making for the users again when we talk about your information these are your economic resources change in your economic resources and your claims in your economic resources or in short, these are your different financial statements. And when we talk about useful for decision making, what are the uh, decisions that are made again? First, that is your management stewardship. Okay. And then another is to hold or sell investments. Third is to collect or settle the loans, okay? If you still remember, we have discussed the different information provided under your financial statement. These are your economic resources, change in economic resources, and then claims on your economic resources, and including the management stewardship. And what are the decisions, again, that is made by your users? First, that is your management stewardship, whether to influence or uh, not the voting of your management. Next, you have your holding or selling of your investment if you are the investor. Next, to collect or settle the loans if you are a creditor. Okay, so this, are like a, this is just like a reiteration of your conceptual framework. However, what is important here, remember, GPFS, PAS1 applies. FPFS, PAS1 does not apply. What are the GPFS? These are your complete set of financial statements. Take note of the relationship of your complete set of financial statements. We go now to our next slide. These are your overall considerations. Again, when we talk about your past one, this is your presentation of financial statements. We have here the different concepts underlying the presentation that is applicable to all your GPFS. So meaning it applies to the six items. And then we have only those applicable to specific items, particularly for your statement of financial position and your statement of comprehensive income. Because a statement of cash flows, this is discussed under your past seven. Okay, So the specifics are more of SFP and SEI. And then those presentations that applies to all, we call this one your overall considerations. 
So what are the overall considerations that should apply to all stand to all your FS? First, we have your fair presentation and compliance with PFRSS. Second, we have your going concern. Third, we have your accrual basis of accounting. Fourth, we have your consistency of presentation. Fifth, we have your materiality and aggregation. Sixth, we have your comparative information. And seventh, we have your frequency of reporting. So take note again, under past one presentation of financial statements, we have here considerations on presentations that is applicable to all your financial statements, meaning your general purpose financial statements, SFP, SCI, SCF, statement of changes in equity, notes to financial statements, and comparative financial statements. So these considerations apply to them. And then we have also your specific considerations on your presentation, particularly applicable only to statement of financial position, statement of comprehensive income. Because for SCF, past seven will apply. Okay, so let's start now with your fair presentation and compliance with PFRS. So fair, fair presentation and compliance with PFRS. So when we say fair presentation and compliance, it means that you will comply to your PFRSS or you will comply to the provisions of your standards. So take note when we talk about your PFRSS again, this pertains to three standards. So we have your PS, PFRS, and we have your PFRIC. Okay, so when you say fair presentation and compliance, your financial statements, your general purpose financial statements, the six items should be fairly presented and should be in compliance with the provisions of your standards. So if your standard will tell you that you will measure it at fair value, you should have presented it at fair value. If your standard will tell you to measure it at cost, then you should measure it at cost. If your standard will tell you to present this one as non-current and never at current, you should present it as non-current item, okay? So whatever is the provision of the standard, you should present and comply to it, okay? That's your fair presentation and compliance. However, there is a specific provision under this past one. It provides here that you must make an explicit and unreserved statement of such compliance in the notes. Normally, this is your note disclosure number one. So normally, this is your note disclosure number one. It is disclosed under your notes that you have prepared the financial statements in accordance with your Philippine financial reporting standards. Take note, you must place an explicit and unreserved statement, meaning you comply with PFRSS. So you should have placed there in your first note or in your note disclosure that there is a compliance with the PFRS. Now, your problem is what if there is a non-compliance? A while back, we said that if ever your standard will provide you that you should measure it at cost, you should measure it at cost. If you should measure it at fair value, you should measure it at fair value. Or if ever it must be presented as non-current, you must present it as non-current. What if there is non-compliance? Meaning you do not comply to the provisions of the standard. There is now what we call a departure to the standard. So what will happen to your departure to the standard? Now, if this departure to the standard is only an error, you must correct it. You must correct it. Meaning, what do we do? We must change whatever is presented in your financial statements. Okay? You must correct it or you must rectify it. This is what is uh, meant by the second one. In appropriate accounting policies are not rectified either by disclosure of the accounting policy used or by notes or explanatory material. So meaning if there is a departure on your standard that is based on an error, you must correct or rectify it. You cannot just place that in your disclosure notes. So you cannot say that uh, I departed from the uh, 
provision of your pass to regarding the measurement of my inventories at its subsequent date or its subsequent measurement. That cannot be because that is considered an error. Again, if there is a departure to the standard and it is considered an error, you correct or rectify it. You cannot check it with a disclosure note. So for example, uh, as we said, your inventory should be measured at net realizable value. That is under pass two for your subsequent measurement. However, you still measured it at cost. You still measured it at cost. So you did not compare it to your net realizable value. So if that is considered an error, what should you do? You should correct or rectify it. You cannot just correct or rectify it by placing a disclosure note. If that is an error. Okay. If that is not considered an error, meaning there is actual departure. If there is an actual departure, so let's say you use the provision of a particular standard, however, you depart on it. So initially, you said that you will comply to your PFRSS. So meaning you comply with these three items. However, you departed on one standard. So let's say you departed on the standard of your uh, revenue. So let's say you departed on the standard of revenue. However, this departure is because the revenue standard is misleading. If you think that the revenue standard is so misleading, you must only disclose the reason. Disclose the reason. So what will you disclose? First, the nature of the departure, the reason, and the impact of the departure. Okay, we go back to your fair presentation and compliance. What is our premise? Our premise under your fair presentation and compliance is that Whatever is the provision of the standard, we should comply to it, okay? And then, under your first note, you must make an explicit and unreserved statement that you are complying to the PFRSS. But what if there is non-compliance, meaning there is now a departure? If there is a departure to the standard and it is considered an error, you should only correct or rectify it. You cannot make a disclosure note. But if that departure is not considered an error, it is an actual departure because the standard is so misleading, then what can you do? You will not correct the error, but you will disclose the reason. What, the, what is the disclosure? You disclose the nature, the reasons, and the impact of the departure. So in our example, we say that your revenue standard is so misleading. Sir, what is our revenue standard? Our revenue standard is governed under PFRS 15. What is PFRS 15? Revenue from contracts with customers. So under revenue from contracts with customers, you recognize revenue once the performance obligation is already satisfied. Sir, what is a performance obligation? A performance obligation is your obligation to perform a particular act as to your buyer. So let's say your performance is to deliver the goods or service. So once you comply the delivery of the good or service, of course, you can already recognize revenue. Okay, that's under PFRS 15. Once there is already a performance of the obligation, or once the performance obligation is already satisfied, we can already recognize revenue. So halimbawa, nagbenta nga tayo ng merchandise, tapos binenta natin yung merchandise, once na deliver mo na daw, eh, makarecognize ka na ng revenue. However, let's say you are under installment sale. Ano yung installment sale? Ibig sabihin, paunti-unti lang yung bayad nung iyong buyer. So hindi mo alam, kung makokolekta mo ba or hindi. Now, your problem is if you can collect all of the installments or not. So, under PFRS 15, you should recognize the whole amount as a revenue. Is that right? Yes, because that's under PFRS 15. 
However, since you think that since you are in an installment sale, it is not necessary that you present everything as a revenue because it depends now on the collectability of the particular revenue, whether you can collect it on time or not, or you will not collect it at all. So you have now a problem under the collectability. Since you have now a problem under collectability, would it be proper to present everything as a revenue once you have delivered it? Or it is more proper to present revenue only upon the collection? I think it is more proper for you to present it once there is a collection because again, you have a problem on the collectability. So here, to not mislead the users that you have higher revenues, but actually there is a problem of, of collectability, what did you do? You departed from the standard. What standard did you depart? PFRS 15. So you will now uh, tell the nature of the departure the reason for the departure, and the impact of the departure. So probably, what is the impact? In your PFRS 15, everything is recognized as revenue once delivered. Therefore, what is the impact? Under your uh, departure on the standard, there will now be a decrease on revenue reported. Why? Because you will now only report the revenue once there is actual collection. Okay? Because there is now a problem on your collectability. So you just explain that. Okay? Only if the standard is so misleading. Okay? And take note, this departure, this departure must uh, give a more relevant and faithfully represented information. Okay? So you give the reason, but take note, the particular departure should result to a more relevant or faithfully represented information. Okay, we go back on this slide. So what did we discuss on this slide? We talk about your fair presentation and compliance on your standards, meaning we comply with the provisions of your PAS, PFRS, and PFRIC. Now, under the uh, past one provision, you make an explicit and unreserved statement on the compliance. Okay, so you place on your disclosure notes or your uh, notes to financial statement, the compliance on the financial statement. So what if you do not comply now? If you do not comply, you have a departure and that departure can be considered as an error. So if that is only an error, meaning there is an inappropriate accounting policy, then you just only correct or rectify it. You can never uh, correct it by disclosing it. So you must correct or rectify it. But if it's really a departure, take note, the departure should only be done if ever the standard is so misleading or the uh, presentation of the information will present more relevant and faithfully represented info. So what should we do here? You cannot correct it or rectify it because you really actually departed on it. But what should you do? You disclose on your notes the nature, reason, and impact of the departure. Okay? Fair presentation of financial statements. Next, we have your overall considerations as to your going concern. So... Going concern is presumed if the financial statement is prepared using PFRS. So in short, if you are compliant to PFRS, it means you are in a going concern. What do we mean by a going concern? Going concern means that the entity will continue to operate in the foreseeable future. Our problem here is what is this foreseeable future? So what is presumed here is that the entity will continue to operate in the foreseeable future. Our problem is what is the foreseeable future? The foreseeable future under your going concern is defined as one year from the date of the financial statements. Okay, so from the date of financial statements, meaning from the reporting date, you look one year thereafter 
if ever the entity will continue to operate. Okay? That's why most of our values are at its fair value, at its cost, because we think that it will still continue, that the business will still continue. Okay? Sir, what if we are not in going concern? If you are not in going concern, it means that you are already in liquidating concern. What do we mean by a liquidating concern? It means that you will not already continue the business. You already terminated the business and you will liquidate the assets of the business. Normally, you are in a liquidating concern if you will present your financial statements at a realizable value, meaning whatever will be collected out of the selling of the assets under liquidating concern. Take note, going concern is presumed if ever you are preparing under PFRS. So if you are a compliant to PFRS, then you are considered in going concern. What is going concern? That you will continue to operate within the foreseeable future. Foreseeable future is one year from the date of the financial statements, normally known as the reporting date. Okay? If you are not in preparation of going concern, meaning you are in liquidating concern. Okay. Sir, what if I think that there is now a problem on your, I think that there is now a problem on my going concern. What should I do? Okay. So if you are not already in going concern, meaning you are already in liquidating concern, you may now disclose that you are already uh, in a liquidating concern or not in going concern basis. And uh, past one requires you different disclosures as to this one. Okay? So again, it is presumed that you are in going concern basis, but once you think that you are not in going concern, it means you are in a liquidating concern, you must disclose that you are not in going concern under PAS1. And PAS1 provides now the different disclosure notes as to this one. Okay, so we're done with two overall considerations. The first one is fair presentation and compliance. The second one is going concern. Now we go to the third one. The third one is your accrual basis of accounting. So under your accrual basis of accounting, you have learned this one already in your AE100 that revenue is only recognized when earned and expense is only recognized when incurred, not when paid, not when received. Okay, I hope you still remember this one in your AE100. So in your accrual basis of accounting, you prepare your financial statements using accrual basis of accounting. This is already given because I told you all of your overall considerations apply to your financial statements. So fair presentation and compliance applies to the six financial statements. And then going concern applies to the six financial statements, including accrual basis of accounting. Sir, why? Because normally accrual basis sir, only affects revenue and expense. Remember the relationship of our, of our financial statements? Whatever is presented in your SCI affects your statement of changes in equity. Of course, also affects your statement of financial statements and your notes to financial statements. Therefore, everything is affected under your accrual basis of accounting. So look as to the relationship I told you. You present it under your SCI because your accrual basis of accounting talks about your revenue and expense, affects your statement of changes in equity, ultimately affects your statement of financial position, and your disclosure notes as to these items. But it does not affect your statement of cash flows, okay? So again, we talk overall considerations apply to all the complete set of financial statements. However, we learned here in your accrual basis of accounting, this does not apply to statement of cash flows. Why? Statement of cash flows is presented using cash basis of accounting. So we look here, the increases or decreases in cash, okay? 
So we're done now with accrual basis of accounting. We proceed to the fourth one. We have your consistency of presentation. So under consistency of presentation, take note, we have discussed this one as a means to meet comparability. If you still remember our discussion under comparability, that consistency is the means to meet your comparability. So to properly compare items, we must be consistent with the application of our standards. So in your consistency of presentation, what is only required to you is to be consistent in the presentation of your standards. So again, if you present before as cash, present it still at cash. Except when circumstances change or there is a new standard. So there are two exceptions under the rule of consistency. What is the general rule? You must be consistent from period to period. What are the exceptions to these rules? First, if the circumstances change. Second, if there is a new standard. So let's have an example on your circumstances change. So for example, guys, before you present as inventory, you present as inventory your property, plant, and equipment. Why? So let's say you are into the, uh, what do you call this one? You are in the realty business. So realty business ka. Ibig sabihin, you are in the buying and selling of your uh, land. Okay? So, nagbebenta ka ng land, bumibili ka ng land, nagbebenta ka ng building, mga realties. That is your original uh, business. So initially, of course, your land and building is presented as inventory. Kasi nga, part siya ng mga binebenta mo. Okay. However, your circumstances change. Meaning, you are not already in the selling of realty, but you are already in the servicing. Servicing. So let's say you are servicing uh, as to the registration lang. Registration of ownership over land. So, yun yung mga service mo. So, initially, it is now land and building. So, before, you present it as inventory. But now, due to the change in circumstances, you will not present it as inventory, but present it as property, plant, and equipment. So, there is now a change on your presentation. So, the change on your presentation is because of your change in circumstances. Okay, so initially, it must be consistent from period to period. So before, panay inventory siya, yung land and building nasa inventory. Pero ngayon, dahil hindi ka na nga nasa realty, nilipat mo na siya sa property, plant, and equipment. Another one, there is a new standard. There is a new standard. So if ever the new standard creates an inconsistent presentation, so... Take note, on your new standard, this is uh, applied prospectively. And to your previous transactions. So normally, a change in accounting policy is brought by your new standard. So it is applied prospectively and previous transactions, meaning it is applied retrospectively. So, i-apply mo daw siya sa past, pati sa future. Okay? So, if that is a retrospective adjustment, in meaning, previously, you have a different accounting, and because of the new standard, you have a new accounting. So, because of this difference and the new, there will be an inconsistent presentation. So, this is an exception to your consistency of present. Sir, so, sabi mo, apply siya sa past. Yung apply sa past kasi is it will be now only accounted. The changes will be accounted in your retained earnings. However, as to presentation, ibig sabihin magkaiba yung pag-present before at saka ngayon. Katulad kanina, pre-present natin siya as inventory kanina, pero ngayon, PPE na. So, there is now an inconsistent presentation. Here, what is brought is the inconsistency of presentation again. 
not be changed. So although the change is applied in the past, whatever is the differences as to the values in the past and the value now will be presented in RE. What we look only is the presentation. The different and the new, there is now an inconsistency in presentation. Okay? So again, consistency in presentation or consistency of presentation. We have learned this one already under your conceptual framework. We said that your consistency is a means for us to meet comparability. And take note, what is required under our financial statements is to meet the common needs of the users to ensure comparability. So to meet this comparability, again, we need consistency. So there must be a consistent application of our standards, including its presentation. But there will be an exception to this rule. The exception is if there is a change in circumstances or there is a new standard, you are permitted to present it inconsistently. Okay? Consistency of presentation. So what are the items that we already finished? First, we're done with fair presentation and compliance. We're also done with going concern. We're also done with accrual basis of accounting and consistency of presentation. So we still have four items. We have your materiality and aggregation as the next item. So materiality and aggregation. So we already discussed when can we say an item is material. We can say that an item is material if it influences the decision making of the users because again, materiality or material is an element of relevance. Okay, it is an element of relevance if you still remember it. Now, if ever an item is material, item is material, it is presented separately. Okay? If an item is material, it is presented separately. Sir, what if the item is immaterial? It can be aggregated. So for example, in your property, plant, and equipment. In your property, plant, and equipment. So you have here your uh, building, which is worth 5 million pesos. And then... You have here printer, which is worth 10,000 pesos. Okay. So what do you think is material here? The building. So let's say the building is material. So this is presented separately as an item of PPE, building. Pero yung printer, isa separate mo pa rin ba? Halimbawa, meron pang uh, office chairs, you know. Office chairs na worth 8,000. Is separate mo pa rin ba? Bali sa PPE, pag break down mo ba siya, ilalagay mo pa rin yung building, tapos ilalagay mo yung printer, ilalagay mo pa rin ba yung office chairs? Not anymore. Because these two items, we can consider them as immaterial. So what is the treatment if ever it is immaterial? If immaterial, we can aggregate it. When we say we can aggregate it, we can join them and we can present them as one. We can join them and we can present them as one. So we can present these two items as one already. So other equipment. So i-present na lang natin siya isa, other equipment, 18,000. Ang laman niya yung dalawa because they are immaterial. So you can aggregate them and present them as one. Again, in your materiality and aggregation, what did we learn here? In presenting your different items of financial statements, Every material item should be presented separately, while immaterial items can be presented as one, meaning they are aggregated. Okay, so here, let's say you have PPE, and under your different property, plant, and equipment, we have the following items. You have building, which is, which is worth five billion, printer ten thousand, office chairs eight thousand. So if you say we are into your materiality and aggregation, we feel. So a while back, we were talking about this materiality and aggregation. And we said that you will only aggregate the immaterial ones. So in this example, we aggregated printer and office chairs because for us, they are immaterial as to value. So 18,000, we presented as one. It is now other equipment. So when we talk aggregation, we present the 
immaterial items, present immaterial items as one. Okay? Materiality and aggregation. We go now to the next one. We have your offsetting. So what is an offsetting? So when we talk about an offsetting, it means that we need to uh, get the net value as to uh, similar items, as to similar items. So for example, uh, you are a creditor of A. So in your, uh, in your financial statements, you have presented their accounts receivable. Yan yung kay A. Uh, 100,000. At the same time, you are a debtor of A. So, may utang si A sa'yo, at the same time, nagka-utang ka din kay A. So, you have accounts payable naman na 50,000. So, when we say offsetting, you try to offset or get the net value of these items. So, since pareho namang A yan, di ba? So, pwede ba nating i-present siya ng AR, 100K, less AP, 50K. So, ang net na lang na AR ay 50K. Can we do that? So, under pass 1, offsetting is not permitted. So, we cannot offset items. We cannot get the net value of items. So, even if there is a relationship between this creditor and debtor as to AR and AP of each other, then we cannot still get the net value of it. We cannot offset it. So, sabi nga natin dito, kay A, as a creditor, uh, we are the creditor of A, X, the creditor of A. So may utang si A sa atin na 100,000. Tapos nagpa-utang nagpa -utang din si A sa atin ng 50,000. So may ut utang tayo kay A na 50, umutang si A sa atin ng 100. Net utang ni A ay 50,000. Hindi natin pwedeng i-present yan as net value. It is not permitted. Therefore, you will still present them separately. Okay? we will still present them as separate items, except if required or permitted by the standard. So that is the loan exception. If ever the standard provides now that you can present it as one. Okay. Remember, an item of your uh, OCI is an investment measured at FVTOCI. So normally this FVTOCI, investment, we have here your gains or losses. So when we say investment, if ever you are aware already, uh, most of people right now, most of uh, those inclined to finance are really trading stocks. So when we are saying trading stocks, we are engaged into the buying and selling of stocks. So since you are engaged in the buying and selling of stocks, you have your gains or losses in that investment. We call that investment. So if that investment is designated at fair value through other comprehensive income, we have your gains or losses. Now, under this, uh, it is permitted that we will present them as one. So we call it na lang unrealized gains or losses. Wag mo na siyang i-present separately na unrealized gains or present separately as unrealized loss. You can present it as one known as unrealized gains or losses. So you can get the net gain or loss already. So there we can already offset because it is permitted by the standard. Take note, we cannot offset as a rule because it is not permitted under pass one. So we should present it separately still. However, if the standard requires you to offset or permits you to offset, then you can offset. So in our example, a while back, may utang si A sa atin, tapos umutang din tayo kay A, Although pareho naman sana yan na kay A, kukunin mo na lang sana yung net value niya. However, that is not permitted under the standard. But if it is permitted, pwede yan. So yan kasi hindi pwede. So again, offsetting, we cannot offset except if permitted or required by the standard. Okay? Next, we have your comparative information. So when we talk about comparative information, these are your informations to compare the current financial statement or current figures, current year figures to other figures. 
So when we talk about comparative information, we try to compare the current year figures to other figures. So normally, in our comparative information, you only compare it to your previous period amount. So normally, let's say uh, 2020, you compare that to 2019. Kaya minsan nakakakita kayo ng FS, may laman siya na dalawang year. We call that your comparative financial statements. So we compare the figures from one particular year or any other years. Meron pa yung malala, uh, meron hanggang 2015, ganun. as in super comparative siya, 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020, comparative figures. So long as you compare your current amounts to previous periods. But normally under past one, we only uh, compare as to your previous year. But if you want to compare it to other previous years, that can also be done. Okay? So you must compare or make a comparative figures in all your financial statements. So if you try to look, if you try to search, try to search the financial statement of your favorite corporation. So let's say uh, mahilig kang uminom. So you look into the corporation, San Miguel Corporation. So tinignan mo yung, tignan mo yung FS ni San Miguel Corporation. You will see there are comparative figures for each type of financial statement. So SFP, SCI, changes in equity, uh, including the cash flows, they have comparative figures. Next, frequency of reporting. Okay, so your frequency of reporting, you must present your financial statements. FS are presented annually. Okay, FS are presented annually. So take note that your FS covers an annual period normally. Okay, what is that annual period again? When we say annual period, that can either be a calendar period, okay? That is a calendar year, meaning uh, it starts at January and ends at December, okay? Calendar year. And uh, if that is not a calendar year, it means it is still a 12-month period. It means that it's still a 12-month period, not starting January. Okay? So it is a 12-month period, not starting January. So that is another annual year. Okay? So sometimes it is called interim periods, interim periods. So not a 12, uh, it's still a 12 month period, but then you uh, do not start at January. So FS covers an annual period. However, you will learn soon when we go through past 34, you can present interim financial reports. So what is this interim financial reports? Uh, these are different periods, periodic financial reports. Periodic financial reports that can be monthly, quarterly, semi-annually. And it provides guidelines as to presentation of your interim financial statements. So again, take note guys that under past one, your FS should be prepared annually. As an exception, we have your past 34, where in some financial statements, our financial statements can be presented either monthly, quarterly, or semi-annually, and the guidelines is presented under past 34. Okay, so let's have a quick recap on what are the general considerations or the overall considerations for statement presentation or financial statement presentation first. We have your fair compliance, uh, fair presentation and compliance with PFRS. We must present fairly in all material respects the financial statement. And then take note, we will make a disclosure note 
that you are compliant with the PFRSS. If there is a departure and that is considered an error, you must only correct or rectify it. But if that departure is really an actual departure for you to not mislead the users and will present a more relevant and faithfully represented information, you must disclose. What will you disclose again? The nature, reason, and impact of the departure. Next is your going concern. All financial statements, once you comply with PFRSS, you are in a going concern. If not, you are in a liquidating concern. So if you are in a liquidating concern, there will be disclosure on your liquidating concern. Next, your financial statements are also prepared at accrual basis of accounting. Why? Because again, there are relationships between your revenue and expense that is presented under your statement of comprehensive income and then statement of changes in equity. And then you have your statement of financial position ultimately and also your notes to financial statements. So your accrual basis of accounting normally affects all of the financial statements. However, it does not apply to a statement of cash flows. Next, we have your consistency of presentation. So under consistency of presentation, we said that the ultimate goal for your uh, financial statement presentation is its comparability. That's why it is only applicable to general purpose financial statements. So what uh, makes your financial statement comparable again? The consistent presentation. So consistency is the means to meet comparability. So under your consistency, take note, your presentation and your classification shall be consistent and retained from one period to another unless, again, there is a change in circumstance or there is a change of a standard. Next, we have your materiality and aggregation. So we said material items should be presented separately. Immaterial items can be aggregated as one and presented as one. Further, we talk also about your offsetting. That offsetting is not allowed. Offsetting is not allowed. However, if it is permitted or required under the standard, then you can offset. Also, we talk about your comparative information. We said that under your comparative information, we will disclose and we will present in our financial statements comparative figures from the previous period's amounts. But normally, comparative is only compared as to your current year and previous year. But there is no holding you back if you want to present comparative figures for the past five years. That can also be done. And on your frequency of reporting, what did we say? You must prepare a financial statement annually. But there can also be an interim financial statement under past 34. Okay, so what are the items again? First, fair presentation and compliance with PFRS. Next, we have your going concern. Next, we have your accrual basis. We have your materiality and aggregation. We have your consistency of presentation. We have your offsetting. And then comparative information and frequency of reporting. These are all your overall considerations. Now we go to your specific considerations. So we're done with overall considerations. Again, these apply to all financial statements. So we talk now on your specific considerations or only those considerations applicable to a certain financial statement. So first, we have your FS presentation in your statement of financial possession. So first, we talk about your uh, statement of financial position. So under your statement of financial position, we distinguish between items of current and non-current. So statement of financial position, we distinguish between current and non-current. So how do we distinguish it as current and non-current? So what are the items of SFP again? We have your assets, liabilities, and equity. So under this FS presentation in SFP, your current or non-current distinction applies only to assets and liabilities. So you only distinguish asset and liabilities, not equity. 
So first, we have your current assets and non-current assets. So on your current assets, what are the items of current assets? First, we have your cash or cash equivalent. So cash, of course, is this is your money or currency. Cash equivalent are your different uh, negotiable instruments readily available for use. And uh, this is defined now under past seven. So under your cash equivalent, that can either be a equity instrument or that instrument in which uh, within the three-month period, we can already collect the cash. So soon we will discuss what is the cash equivalent under PAS 7. So it is a certain highly liquid investment. So when we talk about this highly liquid investment, that can either be debt or equity. But normally, debt investments can only be considered as cash equivalent. We will talk about that soon. Next, uh, when can we see it as a current asset? First, if you real, if that is cash or cash equivalent. Second, if you realize intends to sell or consume it within the normal operating cycle. Do you have financial management as of now? Or did you finish financial management before in your uh, senior high? So what is a normal operating cycle again? This is just like your cash conversion cycle from the time you have your merchandise up to the time you convert it into cash. So for example, you have your raw materials, you will convert it now, you will sell it and until you receive the cash payment out of the selling. That is considered normal operating cycle. So normal operating cycle differs from one business to another business. So for example, guys, if your uh, business is a grocery store, your normal operating cycle normally is just less than one year or less than one month pa nga kung kaya siya. So from the time you purchase your merchandise up to, up to the time you receive cash out of selling that merchandise. Okay? So if ever it is within the normal operating cycle, let's say in a merchandising business, your normal operating cycle is 30 days, then if it's within the 30 days, then it is considered a current asset. Or if that is in a development company. So realty and development. So let's say you are in a realty and development company, guys. What is the normal operating cycle? Sabi nga natin, normal operating cycle differs from one business to another business. So if you are in a realty and development corporation or company, Normally, it takes you years to construct a particular uh, realty. So if ever you are in a realty and development, your, let's say your normal operating cycle is two years. So long as your normal operating cycle is within that period or your asset is within that period, then we can consider it as a current asset. So if you realize, intends to sell or consume it within the normal operating cycle, it is still considered an, it is still considered a current asset, okay? So normal operating cycle, take note guys, differs in between your different businesses. Third one, it expects to realize the asset within 12 months. Sir, I have a problem now. Kanina kasi, pwede natin siyang i-realize within the normal operating cycle. Sir, nagbigay ka ng example, two years yung normal operating cycle. E ngayon, sabi niya, kailangan i-realize mo daw yung asset within 12 months. Paano na yan, sir? E yung two years more than 12 months yan. Pasok pa rin ba yan sa current asset? Yes, kasi number two siya. Pasok siya sa number two. Sir, ano din ang rule? So in number two and three, so that we can harmonize it, you place there, realize, intends to sell, or consume within the normal operating cycle or 12 months, whichever is longer. Okay, so to harmonize it, you place there whichever is longer. So in our example, so although we will only realize this realty and development for, let's say, two years, it is more than 12 months. But since it is longer, we, it is still 
uh, part of your current asset. Because take note, it is normal operating cycle or the 12 months, whichever is longer, whichever is longer. So in a realty development, so although it is more than two years, it's still uh, part of your current asset because it is under number two. It is within the normal operating cycle. Okay? And lastly, if the asset is for trading. So when do we say that the asset is for trading? The asset is for trading if you are into buy and sell that particular asset. So these are your different investments. Okay? These are your different investments. So when can we consider an item as a current asset? First, if that is a cash or a cash equivalent. Second, if it is within the normal operating cycle. Third, if it is within 12 months. So in short, your realization or your intention to sell or consummation is within the normal operating cycle or 12 months, whichever is longer. Take note of the rule to harmonize number two and three you place a phrase there which is whichever is longer. And then the last one, so that we can say it is a current asset, the asset is for trading. How about a non-current asset? A non-current asset is defined residually. So when we say it is defined residually, we have a residual definition on your non-current asset. In short, whatever is not considered a current asset is a non-current asset. So in short, if that is not cash or not a cash equivalent, non-current asset. If you do not realize it or sell it or consume it within the normal operating cycle, it is a non-current asset. If you do not expect it to realize within 12 months, it is non-current asset. If the asset is non-trading, then it is non-current asset. So in short, it is a residual definition. So whatever does not go beyond the definition of a current asset or go within the definition of a current asset, it is considered as a non-current asset. So kabalik tara niya. So kung hindi yan cash or cash equivalent, non-current asset. Kung hindi siya within the normal operating cycle, non-current asset. Kung hindi siya within 12 months, non-current asset. Kung yung asset ay hindi for trading, then non-current asset. Clear? Okay. So let's have an example of this current or non-current asset. So loan receivable entered into on January, I know, July 1, 2016. Due after five years as of December 31, 2019, December 31, 2020, classify the asset. Okay, so we have here loan receivable entered into on, Janu on July 1, 2016, due after five years. As of December 31, 2019, December 31, 2020, you need to classify the asset. So we classify it either as current or non-current. So when can we say it is current again? It is cash or cash equivalent. We can uh, realize, sell, or consume it within the normal operating cycle or within 12 months, or the asset is for trading here. Hindi naman siya cash. Hindi rin siya cash equivalent. Wala din sinabi na asset is for trading. So ano yung test mo? Either two or three. Okay. So on July 1, 2016, due after five years. So what is the due date? The due date is July 1, 2021. Okay. So to classify this one, guys, you compare the reporting date to the due date. So we already computed the due date, July 1, 2021. So we just need to compare the reporting date to the due date. So on the first one, what is the reporting date given? December 31, 2019. What is the due date? The due date given on uh, 
The problem is July 1, 2021. That is for number one. So, pasok ba siya sa 12 months? So, 2019. Okay. Pasok ba yan sa 12 months? No, because this is 18 months. 18 months yan. Therefore, pasok ba siya dun sa 12 months? Sabi natin, hindi. Current, non-current. This is considered non-current asset. Kasi hindi siya pumasok dun sa definition ng current assets na kailangan 12 months siya. O dun sa second naman, ang reporting date mo ay December 31, 20. Ang due date mo ay July 1, 2021. How many months? January, February, March, April, May, June. Six months na lang. Pasok ba sa 12 months rule? Yes. Therefore, current asset. Okay? So, if ever you are to present in the SFP as to whether it is current or non-current, you need to classify the asset. In classifying it, look at the definition of the current asset. So when can we say it is a current asset? It is cash or cash equivalent. If you realize intend to sell it or consume it within the normal operating cycle, or you realize it within 12 months. So to harmonize the two, whichever is longer. And then if the asset is for 3D. So in this example, to know whether it is within 12 months, we just compared the reporting date to the due date. In the first question, as of December 31, 2019, classify the asset. So our reporting date is December 31, 2019. The due date is July 1, 2021. So if we try to count how many months, 12 months for the whole year 2020, January 2021, 13, 13 months already, February 2021, 14 months already. March 2021, 15 months already. April 2021, 16 months already. May 2021, 17 months already. June 2021, 18 months. So since 18 months na yan, hindi na siya pasok dun sa 12-month period. Paano natin siya i-classify non-current asset? Paano naman yung number two? Yung number two naman, it is from December 31, 2020 to July 1, 2021. How many months? Six months. Pasok ba? Yes. So it is considered as current asset. Okay? So ganun lang yung pag-classify natin, kung current or non-current. Tignan mo lang kung papasok siya dun sa 1, 2, 3, and 4, current asset siya. Kung hindi, non-current asset siya. Clear? Okay. Next, we go to your FS presentation in SFP as two liabilities. Take note. The current and non-current classifications apply only to asset and liabilities. We're done with asset. When can we say it again as a current asset? Current asset, if first it is cash or cash equivalent. Next, it is within the normal operating cycle. Next, it is within 12 months. Next, it is held for trading. So, kung pasok siya dyan, current asset. If not, non-current. So, we go now to your liabilities. So for your liabilities, you have here current and non-current classification also. So when can we say it is a current liability? So still, if you can settle it within the normal operating cycle or you expect to settle it within 12 months. So to harmonize this again, if ever you are to settle it within the normal operating cycle or within 12 months, whichever is longer okay so we already discussed what is a normal operating cycle and what is that 12 month period next if the liability is for trading it is for trading if you are into buy and sell so what is new here is this one the last one the entity has no unconditional right to the fair settlement okay so when we say you have no unconditional right to the first settlement, you have no right to postpone in a later date the settlement or payment of the liability. Okay? The so entity has no unconditional right to the first settlement, no right to postpone in a later date the settlement or payment of the liability.
responsibility. Okay. So why is this important? This should be read in conjunction to these two items. Okay. A while back kasi, dun sa asset, anong meron dun? Realize, sell, or consume. Yun yung words na ginamit ng standard. Dun sa 12-month period at normal operating cycle. Dito naman, settle ang ginamit ng standard. Okay? So, this fourth one, entity has no unconditional right to the first settlement, applies to the first and second one. You must read it in conjunction to the two items. So, it means that you have no right to postpone in a later date the settlement or payment of the liability. So, for example, you have a loan payable due on July 1, 2021. Okay. So, as of December 31, 2020, current, non-current. Oh, you count. Due date, July 1, 2021. Reporting date, December 31, 2020. Is it within 12 months? The answer is yes. Therefore, it is a current liability. Bakit loan payable na yan eh? Okay? So, you have a current liability. Now, when we talk about your unconditional right, ibig sabihin daw, pwede mong i-move yung due date. So, kung if you have unconditional right, if you have unconditional right, you may move it. You may move the due date. So, in short, from July 1, you can move it to, let's say, I want to pay it only on uh, December 1 of 2023, year 2023. So, if you have unconditional right, if you have unconditional right, you may move. Bakit importante yung last one na yan? Kasi nga, pagka may unconditional right ka, pwede mong i-move anytime. So, from current, pwede mong gawing non-current. Okay? Pero kung wala kang unconditional right, it will still the same. It will stay the same as current liability. Take note of that. If you have no unconditional right, it will stay the same, meaning you cannot postpone the due date. But if you have unconditional right, you can always postpone the due date. In this example, we postponed it until December 1, 2023. So since you already postponed it, it means you will postpone it for more than 12 months. If you look at it from July 1, 2021 to December 1, 2023, more than 12 months. Yan. So magiging non-current na siya. So, anong kailangan yung tignan dito, guys? If ever, there is no unconditional right. If no unconditional right, it will remain as current liability. If with unconditional right, it will become non-current liability. Okay? Why? Because once you have unconditional right, of course, you will defer it for more than 12 months. So, ganito yan, guys. Ikaw, umutang ka. May utang ka. Alam mong may utang ka, tapos due na siya this year. Pero kung may unconditional right ka, anong gagawin mo? Babayaran mo ba yan this year? Siyempre baka hindi pa. Ang gagawin mo, most probably, i-defer mo yung settlement. Ibig sabihin, ililipat mo into a later due date para hindi mo bayaran agad. So since ililipat mo yan in a later due date, normally that later due date is more than 12 months. That's why it will become non-current. It will become non-current. So are we clear? In your last one, entity has no unconditional right. This is the new one here. You read it in conjunction with the normal operating cycle and the 12-month period. So there must be no unconditional right as to that items. Okay? Now, if ever it does not fall into the definitions of these items, it will go now to your non-current liabilities, just like your current asset. Okay? However, we must learn this following rules under your liabilities. So under liabilities, we have these rules. We have your refinancing. So what is e refinancing? This is an agreement between the debtor and the creditor to postpone the date of the liability or the date of settlement of the liability. So debtor and creditor agrees to settle or to postpone the date of settlement of the liability. 
Debtor and creditor agrees to settle or postpone the date of settlement of the liability. So there are two particular elements that is important here. The first element, the agreement must be done before the reporting date. Okay? Agreement must be done before the reporting date. In short, it must be completed before the reporting date. Second, the postponement must be for more than 12 months. Okay? So there are two requisites. First, the agreement must be done before the reporting date. Second, the postponement postponement must be done for more than 12 months, okay? So that we have a valid refinancing. Take note, in a refinancing, you enter into an agreement. Kailan dapat magagawa yung agreement na yan? Before the reporting date. And then, if you will try to postpone it, must be for more than 12 months. Let's have an example. We have a loan payable. What is the due date of our loan payable? Let's say it's still July 1, 2021. Now, as of December 31, 2020. This is our reporting date. December 31, 2020. Current, non-current. It's still current, right? Because December 31, 2020 until July 1, 2021 is six months. So it's still considered as current liability. However, if we have these following items, an agreement was entered on December 8, 2020 to defer the settlement until August 1, 2022. Okay. So an agreement was entered on December 8, 2020 to defer the settlement until August 1, 2022. What is the first requisite? It must be before the reporting date. What is our reporting date? December 31, 2020. What is the date of the agreement? The date of agreement is December 8, 2020. Is it before? Is it before this is met? So yes, it is before. Next requirement. The next requirement is the postponement must be for more than 12 months from the reporting date. So what is the reporting date? December 31, 2020. What's the new due date? The new due date is now this uh, August 1, 2022. December 31, 2020 to August 1, 2022. Current, non-current. It is now non-current liability. Why? How many years? It is one year and seven months. So it is more than 12 months. So if there is a refinancing, what is the effect? The ultimate effect of a refinancing, it becomes non-current liability. So we have here a current liability. And then you will agree with the creditor to postpone the settlement. What are the requisites? First, it must be done before the reporting date. So dito, ginawa yung agreement on December 8. So that is before December 31, pasok to. Next requisite, the postponement must be for more than 12 months from the reporting date. What is our reporting date? December 31, 2020. What's the new due date? August 1, 2022. So is it more than 12 months? Yes. Therefore, it becomes now non-current liability. So what is the effect of a valid refinancing? If the refinancing is valid, it becomes non-current liability. Okay, let's have another example. So we have a loan payable. The due date is July 1, 2021. So you will have a reporting as of December 31, 2020. So loan payable, the due date is July 1, 2021. As of December 31, 2020, how do we present it? Current liability. However, let's say there was an agreement that is entered again, which makes now the due date, 
which makes now the due date as August 1, 2022. Okay. So, an agreement was signed, was entered on, uh, let's say, January 15, 2021 to defer the settlement until August 1, 2022. What's the first test? It must be done before reporting date. When is the agreement signed? The agreement was signed on January 15, 2021. What is our reporting date? December 31, 2020. Okay? So guys, as you can see, it is done after. After. So hindi na siya pasok. So since hindi na siya pasok, it will remain as current liability. Take note, kailan lang siya magiging non-current liability if ever it is done before the reporting date. So dito, it is done after. So hindi na pwede yan. Kahit na yung due date is more than 12 months. Kailangan before the reporting date and postponed for more than 12 months from the reporting date. Okay? So please, please take note of this refinancing. What is the effect of a refinancing? It becomes, if there is a valid refinancing, there is a non-current liability. But we have here two requisites. First, it must be done before the reporting date. Second, it must be postponed for more than 12 months from the reporting date. Okay? Also, in your liabilities, we have here your breach of covenant. What is a breach of covenant? When we say breach of covenant, this is a breach on the agreement under your contract. So for example, uh, under your contract, so you loaned, loaned 5 million pesos. Under that contract, you will not sell any of your assets within the five-year period of the loan. So umutang ka, pero sabi doon sa kontrata nyo na hindi ka daw pwedeng magbenta ng kahit anong asset mo within the five-year period. So what if nagbenta ka ng asset mo? Anong effect niyan? You breach the covenant. If there is a breach of covenant, what is the treatment? It is already considered as current liability. So once you breach the covenant, kahit anong period pa yan, magiging current liability na agad siya. Sir, question. Pwede ba uli maging non-current liability yan? Yes, it can be a non-current liability if there is a valid refinancing. So babalik ka dun sa rule ng refinancing. Clear? Okay, breach of covenant. Once you breach any of the covenants or any of the stipulations under your agreement, it will become a current liability. However, if there is a valid refinancing, you can present it now as non-current liability. So again, once it is breach, current liability. Pero if there is a valid refinancing, non-current liability. When is there a valid refinancing again? You go back to these two items. It must be done before the reporting period and the postponement must be for more than 12 months from the reporting period or reporting date. Okay? So, current and non-current liabilities. Now, we go to your FS presentation in SCI. As I told you, when we talk about your specific, specific FS presentation, that is only to SCI and statement of financial position. We're done with this. We go now to this. In your SCI, there is a rule on your presentation of expenses. You can use the nature of expense or your function of expense. So under your nature of expense, we aggregate them according to their nature. If that is for repair, you still present it as repair. If that is for, uh, that is for salaries, you present it as salaries. Clear? But in function of expense, you classify the expense according to their function. So for example, we have here a repair. And this repair is for admin. And we have for operations. And uh, yun lang, admin and operations. So if that repair is for admin, yung function is for admin, idadagdag mo pala siya sa administrative expenses. Ganon. If it's for operation, let's say idadagdag mo siya sa cost of sales or dun sa overhead mo. Okay. In your SCI, how do we present your expense according to their nature? If the nature is repair, you will still present it as repair. 
If the nature is salary, you is still present it as salary. However, in your function of expense, you need to look at to the type of expense based on their function. So repair, if the function is for admin, you place it in your administrative expense. If the function is for operation, you can place it in your cost of sales or overhead. Clear? Okay. How about if you have salaries? If your salaries is for admin, you place it as part of admin cost. If it is for operations, you part it as item of direct labor. If that is for sales, you place it on your sales cost or distribution. Normally kasi sales and administrative pinagsasama, di ba? So, pwede yan. Sales or distribution cost. So, in your nature, whatever is the expense, yun na siya. Function, you still group it based on their function. So, dito yung repair, let's say yung function niya is admin, ilagay mo siya sa admin. Operation, ilagay mo sa cost of sales or overhead. Okay. So, what did we learn under your specific presentation? Under SFP, you present current and non-current the items of asset and liabilities. For SCI, your expenses must be presented either nature of expense or function of expense. So either of the two. It can be nature, it can be function of expense. That's it for your IAS1 presentation of financial statements. So we talk about your overall considerations which now applies to all your financial statements. And we also talk about your specific considerations will that will only apply to your specific financial statements.